Welcome to Precious Testimonies. I'm Norm Rasmussen, your host. In the Old Testament, Book of Psalms, chapter 96, verse 3, it reads, Declare God's glory among the nations. Well, Precious Testimonies Evangelistic Ministries is a non-denominational outreach ministry purposing to do just that. Allow people to testify of what Jesus Christ has done in their lives and what he means to them. Let's listen now to what these people have to share about this one who they believe to be none other than God himself. None other than the one who took all of their punishment so on the judgment day they won't have to answer to God, the Father, or Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, God, for their sins. But it will be a time of coronation. A time of reward, a time of celebration. Let's listen now. Both of my parents um, were drug addicts. They used, you know, my, while th my mom was pregnant with my two older sisters and with me as well. So I was born addicted to crack cocaine. Um, my life, just from the very beginning, was very dark. I, I had a hard time composing myself this morning because when I think about all the things that the Lord has done in my life and all the things that he's brought me through and the plan that he has for my life, it's just so overwhelming and so amazing to me to think that a God as big as he is and a God as mighty as he is and a God as loving as he is can see me and love me personally. Amen. Amen. From the time I was little, you know, growing up in that and being born into that, uh, there is just a darkness. The devil has had his hand on my life for as long as I can remember. I, uh, I grew up in a lot of darkness. I was alone a lot. My parents were always out um, selling drugs. My mom was always asleep or, or nodding out. I can remember walking in the kitchen and watching my mom just fall to the ground, just falling asleep and, and us driving and me being eight years old having to grab the wheel because she's falling asleep and, and just having to really take care of myself and be strong for myself all the while the devil is just telling me that nobody sees me, nobody cares about me. I was bullied really bad in school because I was poor <coughs> and um, you know, the devil just told me, nobody can ever love you. Nobody ever will care about you. Nobody will even notice you. And I, I grew up believing that. The time I was in the fifth to the sixth grade, I was molested um, repeatedly. And I just didn't tell anybody because I didn't think anybody would care anyways, you know. And I just let it happen. And, and as I got older, I just started getting into abusive relationships, both mentally and physically, because I thought that's what I deserved. And I thought nobody... You know, just what the devil told me. Nobody could ever care about me, and that was the best I was going to get, and at least it was, you know, some days were okay, you know, and I just started using drugs. I wanted that acceptance and that love from my parents, so I just started using drugs with them. We would cook drugs and sell drugs and do drugs together, you know, and I just thought this was, okay, this is getting better, you know, and I just accepted that in my life I was going to be miserable and I was going to be sad and nobody cared. But that's not true. Uh, the Lord, I, I was brought to my knees. I cried out to God and just said, if you are real, please end my life. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to feel this way anymore. And he picked me up yeah. and set me at Teen Challenge. And it is the best thing. Well, Jesus is the best thing yeah. that's ever happened to me, but he, he brought me here and he showed me that there are people that will love you for who you are. You don't have to do things for them. You don't have to be any kind of way for them and they can just love you. And he has shown me his love and the devil knew that if I could experience the power and the love of Jesus Christ in my life, that I would never turn back. Yeah. And that is exactly what he did. He brought, the Lord brought me here and showed me that. and showed me that it's possible to be loved. 
and that people love you and that he loves me. Most importantly, he loves me and he cares for me and he, he created me. And there is nothing better than knowing that there is a God like that. And I just plan to, I, I will never go back. I will never turn back. I graduated in November. I've actually been on staff here for three months. Yeah. And it's just been amazing. It's a privilege to be able to pour into these students and uh, exactly what I've gotten here and show them that it's possible and that there is a loving God and that, that he has had his hands on their lives and just has carried them through. So thank you for hearing my testimony. Amen. Yeah, anxiety and depression have basically defined who I was for as long as I can remember. In second grade, I was diagnosed with severe anxiety and depression, and I was put on lots of medications for that, and my world just revolved around getting to the counselors and getting to the therapist, making sure I'm taking my medications. I was told I couldn't live a normal or successful life without them, and I just felt so ashamed of myself from that young age. Um, I was molested, and that just put more hatred towards myself. I couldn't look in the mirror. I just hated everything about myself, and I wanted to run away from myself, and by trying to do that, I ended up hanging out with older kids, started drinking and smoking in eighth grade, and it was the perfect thing I thought that would numb me, numb me enough where I wasn't knowing who I was or my panic and my sorrows. I couldn't feel them anymore, and that just became my life. My parents really had no idea that in high school I was, you know, doing drugs every day because I was so isolated from them, but that's my, that was my life. And um, I graduated high school, I started going to college, but by that time drugs and alcohol had complete control over my life. I didn't see a purpose. I was just living so recklessly. I just wanted to die. I didn't care about myself or anyone around me. And um, you know, I was doing drugs because I hated myself and then eventually it didn't matter if I was doing drugs or not. I still hated myself and I couldn't run away from my pain any longer. And I felt the only option I had left was to end my life. But I praise God that he didn't let that happen to me. And after multiple failed attempts to take my own life, I ended up reaching out to my mom in the middle of the night. And um, a few days later, I was at Teen Challenge and I didn't think I was going to make it. I know probably everyone else didn't think I was going to make it either. I was so terrified. I, For the first time in almost my entire life, I had nothing to rely on. But there, when I had nothing to rely on, I leaned on the Lord. Yeah. And, you know, he has set me free and delivered me. He holds me in his arms. And I know I am no longer chained by anxiety or depression or addiction. And I'm no longer ashamed. I'm no longer hopeless. I have a purpose, and that's to serve the Lord. And I'm just so excited for his plans for my life and just to see what the future holds. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Tara has been with us several months now, and so we're going to have her share this morning. Uh, when she came into our program, I felt like God witnessed to my spirit, she's home. And Teen Challenge would be a home for her. And uh, that's what it's been. And uh, we just thank God that she's with us and the wonderful work that God did in her life, but what he's doing through her today. We love you, Tara. God bless. <laughs> These testimonies never, never, ever grow cold. They never get old. Um, when Autumn came into the program, she stayed in my apartment. <laughs> I just, uh, just to see the work that God's doing in everybody's life. And Let me just say this. Yeah. <laughs> she, she couldn't even stay in with the girls in the dormitory because she was so, had so much anxiety and fear and um, just uh, really uh, miserable. And so we put her in with the staff, and the staff just coddled her, helped her, prayed with her, and uh, helped get her through those first few days, and a couple of days anyway, and then she finally was able to go into the dorm. She got relaxed a little bit in Jesus, and anyway, take her from there. <laughs> yeah, now she's playing guitar, and I was playing the drums for the first time in my life, so <laughs> and worship the other day. Okay, so anyway, my name is Tara. I am, I'm 43 years old. I'm the elderly in the group. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I grew up in a small town, in a, in a small town church. And I thank the Lord for having his hand on me at a very, very young age. Um, I grew up in Sunday school, and every time the doors were open, I was there, me and my sisters. I had a very, very poor home life. Um, 
uh, sad to say, but it was, I, I made myself, make sure I got myself to church, and that's where I grew up. I grew up learning how to do things for people, how to be the best. If I could just be good, then all the people around me would love me, and they would, they would like me. They would, they would want me around, and, and that's how I fit in at church. Well, that carried over into my adult life, um, just doing things for people, just always people-pleasing, um, learning all different trades so that I could help out in everything, every area, being like the best in sports and the, try to be the best in, in music. I went to college for vocal performance, and and started pursuing a music career, and I just wanted to be the best in everything. Well, we just, I just kept growing um, farther away from the Lord as I relied on myself for everything. I just thought that there was these boxes I had to check off in life. I had to go to school. I had to, I had to um, get married. I had to start having children, um, and I did all of those things, and I had this picture-perfect life. I was married to a doctor in the military, and and we traveled everywhere. I didn't have a home. We just, I traveled everywhere and as a child too, but I just was always moving, always moving, and my kids were always moving, and just life just kept getting more and more stressful, and I wasn't relying on God. I was relying on myself. I had no relationship that seeing my Savior is that beautiful Savior that he was talking about this morning. I had no idea what that meant. I was I used him to, to get me places, but I didn't understand how falling in love with him would help my life. And I just, um, sure enough, you know, that comes crashing down pretty quick when you rely on yourself. And I turned to alcohol, just like my parents had. And I turned to alcohol more and more and more um, just to make it through the day, just to be that perfect soccer mom, just to be that, you know, that perfect everything that I, I thought it was perfect. It was very obviously not and um i just i just started turning to more and more alcohol and and um soon enough uh, just life just you know once you turn to that you once you turn away from god things got worse and worse and i started turning away from my marriage i i looked outside of my marriage for comfort i started um having an adulterous relationship as well so it was just a very downhill spiral that uh, quickly led me to um one day I was driving and I had a DUI car accident where I, um, it was a hit and run car accident where I injured somebody really bad. I put them in a wheelchair and gave them brain damage and I ended up uh, putting myself in a year in prison. And um, I thank God that that's all that he had for me there. Um, he gave me another chance, but I didn't take it. He kept his hand on me, but I didn't take it. He never let me go. It took me, that was 10 years ago. I lost my marriage. I lost my children. I, I have a granddaughter now. I, you know, it just was such an ugly downhill spiral of never thinking that I was worth anything, losing everything that I thought that I had gained in life and never turning to the Lord is what I I needed to do. I thank God that he finally, after years of trying to get better and rehabs and everything, he brought me to my knees and he did bring me up here to Teen Challenge after, oh, I thank the Lord that he found me and that he never let me go. And he brought, when he brought me up here to Teen Challenge, I was just so lost and desperate and so hopeless and I thank the Lord that he really really used Teen Challenge he used our pastors I, I feel so loved like Taylor was saying I've never felt loved I know I'm 43 years old still wishing my daddy would love me you know but I don't need that anymore I need the love of my savior and, the, and I found the love of of good Christian people my pastors my leaders and and um, I know my worth now and I know what he has he has such a purpose for me. I have been on staff here at Teen Challenge for about eight months, and I'm just home. <laughs> I got, <laughs> I moved to Michigan, and I am home, and I just thank you so much for supporting Teen Challenge, because I was broke when I got here. I had not a dime to my name, and um, through people like you, I could restart my life and, and just live for him like he purposed for me. Thank you for hearing my testimony. I grew up in a Christian home where every Sunday was getting up and going to church and I knew early on that I believed that Jesus was the Son of God and that He died on a cross and that He rose again. 
growing up, I kind of just thought that that's what being a Christian was all about, was that as long as you believe that, that you were good. Later in my high school years, I started to, to stop going to church. I started to get involved in, in just partying a little bit. And my real passion was, was music. And in my mind, I was going to be this rock star and, and that I didn't need to go to, to college and that I had life figured out. Music was really what made me happy and what I kind of put my identity in. After my first year of college, I was with a band that eventually got signed and I was working in the music industry, which is something I loved. And I thought like, this was it. This is who I was. This is what uh, was going to bring me the happiness and joy that I really needed in life. But the music business is not an easy place to be. And, you know, it didn't last very long. Once being in a band didn't work out, I started to work in the music business and I started to make really good money. And so I started to think being a musician is not really what's going to make me happy. Being wealthy and well off, that's where true happiness comes from. And it was all about um, having money and being more well off than all my friends who were going through the typical four years of college. You know, after a while, the, the money didn't really satisfy. And so I decided the next thing that was gonna make me happy was was just more drinking and, and doing drugs. And so at the end of the day, I wasn't addicted. And I thought, so as long as I wasn't being addicted to, to drugs or alcohol, that, you know, it was okay. Again, at the end of the day, I believed that Jesus was the Son of God, and so that's all that I really needed. The funny thing is that you don't really notice when you start pushing that line. And so, you know, the, the occasional weekend turns into every weekend, I just kept on finding that I just was never happy. And so um, later on, I decided the thing that was going to make me happy was relationships. And so I started to put all of my attention into relationships I was in. And, you know, with those relationships, it wasn't enough to be in those relationships after a while. Then we needed to be sexually active. And but then sex wasn't really satisfying me either. And so I moved out of my parents' house because I thought the problem is that I'm still living under my parents' roof. and. That just kind of led to more partying and, and more uh, recklessness. And slowly, without me noticing it, my life just started to spin out of control. Um, but again, I, I, I never really noticed it when it was happening. And I, and I thought that everything was good and I had everything under control. But after a while, again, like the, the drugs and the alcohol and the partying was not really satisfying. And so when relationships fell through, I decided well, I'm not going to put all this time into these long relationships. What's going to make me happy is having many relationships. And so I just started, you know, picking up girls on the weekends at, at bars and stuff. And I thought I was happy. Um, and the thing that really kind of first hit home with me was when um, I got that phone call and a girl had called me and told me that she was pregnant uh, and that I was the father. And at that moment, it was just like that, oh, God moment. But, you know, in my mind, I thought, well, I'll just take responsibility for this. There's nothing wrong with it. And, and so I told her that, that I wanted to talk about you know, pursuing keeping the child. And she told me that she had already decided that she was going to have the abortion. And she just wanted to let me know before she went in and got it. And you know, at that time, I, I just said, that's fine, whatever decision you want to do. And it wasn't until like days later that it really sunk in what had happened. And, and I thought, like, where have I come? where you know nothing has been making me happy and I kept on going through uh, life just thinking the next thing's gonna make me happy, the next thing's gonna make me happy, but all these relationships and, and all the drugs and all the alcohol kind of just left me empty. Um, and at this moment, I, I got really depressed. And so at that point, I felt like there was no turning back towards God, that I've kind of like damaged my life a lot. And so now I was trying to just kind of deal with these relationships and, and these emptiness feeling and, and the guilt of of this girl having an abortion. And so for me, it just meant that I needed to do more drugs and, and drink more. And so I would just kind of party even more. And it was just kind of to try to numb the pain. And all it did was leave me more depressed. And it kind of left me to points where I just, just thought to myself, what's the point of, of life? What's the point of really being here if we're never going to be happy? I was out having dinner with some friends and, and we were drinking and I was um, popping uh, painkillers and next thing I knew I was sitting down to a, a sushi dinner and um, when I woke up it was hours later and I was sitting in, in a bar that I didn't even know how I got there the, the thing was when I woke up it wasn't because I just kind of came to 
I was completely blacked out and, and I heard this audible voice say, wake up. And at that moment, my eyes opened and I looked around and I didn't know where I was. And, and that same audible voice said, I need you to get up and I need you to leave right now. Um, and it was almost like there was, there was no questioning this voice. I just knew that this voice was trying to tell me something that I really needed to do and, and that was really important. And so I got up and I, I just left the bar and, and I was stumbling home. And you know, as I was walking home, I just heard this voice um, saying like, I'm here. I knew it was God. And as I just like walked my, myself home, I was just, the tears just came in. I was just so broken. And I just knew at that moment that God was there and that he was still invested in me, even though I had turned my back on him and, and how I just kind of given up on, on turning to God. And I just wanted to do everything on my own. And I just felt so guilty because I knew at that moment that God knew everything that I was doing. God knew what I had made my life into. I remember getting to uh, my, my apartment and then I just fell to my knees outside. I just cried out to God and I said, God, I need you to please forgive me. I need you to take me back. And I, and I said, God, if, if you would, would take me back, I promise you, God, that I would live my life completely for you, that I would follow you wherever you want me to go without question. And it was this supernatural feeling of literally like these chains that were on me had just been released. And it was Christ taking away all those years and all those events of guilt and, and sin off of me. And it was him kind of just taking me into his arms. And, and I just bawled and I cried and I just knew that, that God was real and that I knew that there was more than just believing that Jesus was God. That God was like with me every step of the way. And so from that moment on, I knew that I needed to make a change in my life. I knew that I couldn't keep going down the path that I was going. And so I started to go back to church. I started just get into God's Word. I started to, to be involved in, in church ministries. The joy that came back into my life, the peace that came back into my life, the meaning that, that life had now because I was following God was, was amazing. I think part of me felt like because I had that abortion with that girl and that like maybe that was the opportunity that God was giving me to be a father and I threw it away. That, that maybe it was not gonna ever happen until about almost two years ago where uh, my wife and I had our beautiful baby girl and that was just really, for me, this uh, assurance that God had taken the old life that I had lived and that that was no more and that he had this new path and this new life in store for me and it just brought so much more life into me. He cares about us. He, he cares about us coming to Him and, and having this relationship of communion with each other, right? So it's, it's this conversation that we have with God. It's this walking, it's this growing together. And, and so that's what God really desires for us. And when you put your hope and, and trust in, in the things of the world, it it's eventually runs out and, and it just leaves you wanting more. But Christ is what brings all this peace in your life. And without Him, you're left with that wanting and that desire that there is nothing there that's making you whole, but Christ is what makes you whole. My name is Andrew and this is my story about how God redeemed me and changed me. I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. John 16:33. Hello, my name is Wendy. For those of you who don't know me, uh, this is my testimony on how I came to know Jesus Christ and how I became a Christian. I have been a Christian now for about eight years. Um, I've never publicly shared my testimony before in all that time. And um, the reason being is because my testimony involves demons, demonic oppression, and the spirit world. And unfortunately, in the culture I live in, in American culture, um, the supernatural, the paranormal, the um, spirit world in general is a topic that's just not really um, honored at all. It's kind of mocked instead. So if you go to talk about it, you can be called crazy, labeled mentally ill, um, unintelligent, uneducated, just a fool. So um, I kind of kept to myself my testimony and I picked and choose who I told it to, just, you know, for the sake of bearing good fruit with my testimony. But for whatever reason, right now, the Lord's really impressing upon me and laying it on my heart to share this. So um, 
it's unusual for me and it makes me feel vulnerable, but I am happy to do it for the kingdom of God, so um, this is my testimony. There was a lot that happened in high school. I was very depressed, um, empty. There was like a hole in my heart, something that was just unfulfilled, and I did not know what that was, but it was, it was just hard to deal with and hard to push through, but I did, and I made it to college. I really got into partying. I got into partying a lot. I was drinking several times a week. If not multiple times a week, it was at least every weekend. I was smoking a lot of pot. Um, I liked to smoke marijuana at the time, so it was whenever I could afford it, I would. And then I also got involved with um, experimenting with hallucinogenic drugs, and I was going to music festivals and living a hippie lifestyle where it was very close to the earth and uh, free living, paganism, mysticism, Wicca spirituality is what I was involved in. It was while I was in that lifestyle that a demonic entity entered my life. Um, at the time, I did not recognize it as a demon. I was very confused. I was very deceived. There was just this elaborate deception. It was like a veil over my eyes. I mean, that's the way the Bible describes it. But at the time, I, I had rejected Christianity from a young age. I really didn't think there was much t truth to it, so I I'd never read the Bible, I just didn't really think about it at all. And at the time that this happened, where I started to get um, demonically oppressed, it was basically like a haunting was happening to me. I was living at college at the time, and I lived. my college was fairly close to where I had grown up, so I lived in between those places. I would go home on the weekends, most weekends, and then spend my week at school. And this haunting was, it was just, it was inside of me. It was following me wherever I went. and. The best way I can describe it was just like your typical haunting you see on TV. It was very real. Uh, most people did not believe me. I was kind of coming unhinged. I was mentally unstable. I was just sad all the time. My depression was out of control. My anxiety was out of control. I was inebriated a lot. I was definitely using substances too much. It was basically self-medication. I had gone numb. Um, I was making terrible choices. I had no respect for myself. Um, it was just a really, really bad time. And so then with this demonic activity added on, I just started to completely unravel and I was basically slipping into madness. So I started reaching out to people around me. I reached out to um, friends and family a little bit, but um, I was careful what to say to some people because I knew that they just wouldn't understand what I was going through, they wouldn't believe it, but a lot of people I just told them what was happening to me and they all just thought I was crazy. A lot of my friends that I partied with I could really tell didn't want to hang out with me anymore and quite honestly I can understand why. I was just such a mess that I think I was just too too weird for them and too deep for them at the time. Some people did try to help me but they didn't really know how and there was only one person that I know really believed me and accepted what I was saying was true and that I was actually being haunted. It was one of my roommates and my best friend at the time and she was with me a lot and she just saw some things that were totally unexplainable and she didn't know what or she didn't know why but she knew that something was tormenting me that we couldn't explain. So this was the state of my life. I'm about 21, 22 years old, this is going on. I was haunted like this for two years and at the end of this two year period I was so broken that I am convinced that I would have killed myself or I just would have died of the demon would have killed me. I was so not okay at all. It was in this time that I ended up meeting the man who is now currently my husband. Now at that time he met with me and we went on a date and I'm not even sure why he went on a date with me, but I'm pretty convinced that it was God. It was something divine because it was just the timing was perfect. If it wasn't for this, I don't even know where I'd be today. But he was very open and not ashamed of what he believed, and he wasn't afraid to talk about it. He's a very open, welcoming person. So he and I started debating for about three days straight. We would meet with each other and we would talk and we'd talk and talk. And I was telling him my beliefs, which were, you know, I was pagan and I was into Wicca and I didn't believe in God or Jesus. Um, I wasn't a complete atheist as I had been at one point in my life, but I was now, I guess you'd call it agnostic. I just, I believed in something, but I wasn't willing to define it. And he believed very passionately about God and Jesus and he believed in angels and demons and, um, so we went back and forth 
basically just having these really deep discussions about life where we just did not agree. I just had so many supernatural experiences that I'd never had one with Jesus. I'd never had one related to God, so I kind of just figured, you know, that can't be the truth, and I was pretty much rejecting what my husband was saying to me. So we had these discussions, and it was the third day. I went to his place, and he said, well, do you want to watch a movie? So I said, sure, let's watch one. And um, he said, go ahead and pick one. There's a box there. So I was going through the DVDs, and for whatever reason, I picked out The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Now. That is a freaky movie. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but I don't even know why I chose it. I had already seen the movie. I saw it in theaters and it was creepy then, but I mean, I'm not even that into horror, so I don't know why I picked it to watch. So anyway, I picked it out and he said, sure, let's watch it. So I put it in and we're watching this movie. And as we're watching it, um, I just, it was like, it was like I'd been punched in the gut. It was just this feeling of like, this movie is so familiar to my life and I just was watching it and I'm like I think that this is happening to me and it was very unsettling and very disconcerting and I was just I was so uncomfortable for the whole movie as I was watching it I could barely get through to the end because it was so disturbing to me because I just I could see the parallels with my life so many parallels and I I was disturbed so at the end of this movie I looked at him and I said you know, I think this is happening to me, what's happening to the girl in the movie. And in this three-day discussion we've been having, I've been telling him about, you know, my haunting and my, what I had come to now think was like a spirit guide. And he had already suggested to me that he thought it was a demon and it was trying to control my life and to steal my soul. And I had, you know, kind of just shrugged that away in our conversation. But he said, no, I think you're right. I think that is what's happening to you. And so he asked, can I pray for you? And it was in that moment when he asked me that, that, that I opened just the tiniest sliver of my heart to the possibility that God might exist. Just the tiniest crack in the door of my heart um, to him. And I thought within myself, I kind of prayed and said, God, if you're real, if Jesus Christ is real, I want to know the truth. And so I took his hands and he started to pray for me. And the prayer was very simple. He just prayed, you know, God, thank you for Wendy. I want to lift Wendy up before you. I pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that this demonic oppression would be lifted from her and that the demons will have to leave and that it, she would no longer be burdened by this. This was literally the defining, changing moment of my life. It just changed everything for me. It was like the finger of God reached down and now this was a vision. I mean, I wasn't seeing it with my eyes, but it was within me. The finger of God reached down and just touched my center, like the center of my being. And there was this brilliant flash of white light, like an explosion. And the power in this light, it was like, there was like color in it, but it was white, brilliant white at the same time. And it, it was just a love and a purity just swept through my whole body. The darkness that was inside of me was obliterated, literally obliterated, nothing left of it. I felt it go and it was gone. And I let go of his hands after the prayer was over and I just sat there kind of in shock because the depression and the heaviness that had been on me, that had weighed me down for so long was gone. The hole in my heart, that emptiness I had talked about earlier, it was filled. I was no longer, there was no longer an emptiness. And I was just breathtaking and mind blown and I just couldn't even, I couldn't even wrap my mind around it. I was, I was kind of in shock. And uh, everything just felt different. It was like, you know, you pat yourself down like when you're trying to find something that you're carrying on you and it's not there. You're like, where is it? It had just been so many years carrying this burden and the depression and the like, the emptiness that I didn't even know what it felt like not to have that. And now all of a sudden here I am and, and I'm liberated, I'm free of it. And it was amazing, but so overwhelming. And I just sort of sat there in shock and actually tried to convince myself a few times that no, that didn't happen. You, you just, you're just, you wanted it to happen. You're just, you're just acting crazy. But there was no denying this. It was, it changed my life forever. That exact moment, that exact prayer in the name of Jesus, the demons cannot stand. And it was in that moment that I just knew the truth of it. It had been a demon. God was real. Jesus was real. It all was real. And I had just been liberated by that power that they talk about. 
And so I still didn't really know anything about the Bible. I wasn't, I didn't really know anything about Jesus or Christianity other than what, you know, we talked about in our debates for the last three days. So in the coming weeks, things just started changing so quickly. I still lived at college, so it was the weekend I was with him, and he drove me back to college, dropped me off at my dorm, and I was walking there. I had a short walk from the parking lot to my dorm. And as I'm walking, it's nighttime and it's winter and there's snow on the ground. Now I'm an artist and I've always just loved and been captivated by the beauty of nature and all the colors in nature and I've always been, you know, able to capture that. But it was literally like I had been seeing in black and white before compared to how I was seeing things now. It was just incredible. Everything had a new dimension and the colors were so much more intense. And I remember the moonlight shining down on the snow that was laid out and it was shimmering and there was just like a rainbow shine to the to the sparkle of the snowflakes on the ground and like it was winter, you know, the coldest, most dead, most colorless months of the year. And here I was seeing all of this amazingness and I just wanted to dance and sing and laugh and I, I've never felt so much joy. Never before in my life had I felt so much joy and I was just filled with the Holy Spirit. Which at the time I didn't know that that's what it was, but as I came to learn more and read the Bible and understand it, and in that moment that God touched me, I had not only had the demons been cast away from me, I had been supernaturally healed of depression. I had been given a new heart, which is what it means to be born again in Jesus Christ. It's when you literally get a new heart, so your old one has died and you're just like resurrected with Christ in this new life. And I had been filled with the Holy Spirit, who now dwells with me and has ever since, this entire eight years, the Holy Spirit has dwelt with me. It's just been amazing. But to get back to the story, um, that next coming weeks I was just a changed woman, I totally changed. I could now feel things around me. I had discernment. It was like a veil had fallen off of my eyes and I could see the world in an entirely different way. And I realized the life I had been living and I was able to see myself and how like wicked I had been. I had been acting in so much wickedness and selfishness and even though I wasn't you know, intentionally evil, I was so lost and in my lostness I had committed so many sins against myself, against God. and. As the weeks went on, I just wanted to devour the Word of God. I wanted to, I just wanted to read it every day. I wanted to know everything about it. And I am a speed reader. I can read very quickly. So I just read the Bible cover to cover in like two weeks or something. I don't even remember how, how long it took me, but um, I just wanted to know everything that I could. And it brought me such a deep understanding of Christianity. And I realized that all the things I had perceived about it before, like, I knew nothing. I knew nothing about it, and I had made so many assumptions, so many misconceptions about God. And at the same time that I was reading the Bible, I also just felt led by the Holy Spirit to start writing down my sins, the things that came to mind, and repenting for each one. I would just write it down, and then I'd repent. I'd say, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. Repentance is so important to the Christian faith because that's what God wants. He wants a heart that that can acknowledge the sin and be done with it. And then God will separate us from our sins and he has, he's forgiven me. And the forgiveness feels so good because it's just that stuff, that shame and the pain, it, it, it's all part of that weight that weighs you down. And um, I also made a vow during that time period that I would no longer pollute my body with substances and I would no longer do anything willfully that would inebriate me because I wanted to keep a sober mind because a sober mind is a huge protection in the spiritual realm against demonic activity. I mean, your sober mind is, is important. So I wanted to be sober and by the grace of God, I have kept that vow and for eight years I have been completely sober and I never intend to do anything to the contrary ever again. It's, it's beautiful to be sober, but it was amazing to see the world the way that I was seeing it and I could see the lostness and the wickedness and the compassion I felt for people. You know, before before this moment that I got touched by him and saved, I really hated people. I despised people. I, I mean, people aren't nice. They're not nice to be around. Everybody's lost and suffering and we're all so selfish and it was just, I didn't like people. I didn't like humanity at all. But now I had this compassion and this love and, you know, these people that were just so lost and dark. I just wanted to reach out and, and 
give them the light of God that I had. And of course, you know, that's not possible because God is the only one who can do that for everyone. I mean, we can't do anything. It's all through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's how the Holy Spirit works. But that is my testimony. Um, which is definitely condensed. There's so much more I could talk about. But I do want to say, as I'm wrapping this up, to get back to the whole thing about demons and the supernatural. Demons are real. It is easier to believe that they're not, I know. It's more comforting and, I mean, it's tough to believe that something like that is real. It's frightening. But, I mean, that's reality. Like, we need to acknowledge reality. And if something like this is happening to you, I believe you. I will pray for you. You can contact me and I'll pray for you. If you have watched this testimony and you want to know Jesus, if you want what I talked about, that Holy Spirit and that awesome, amazing, supernatural presence in your life and righteousness and freedom, then get on your knees and cry out to God. Cry out to him and tell him you want to know him and he will come to you because seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. It's in scripture. He wants that relationship with all of us. Hell was not made for us. Hell was made for the for the devil and his demons, which are truly, truly evil and wicked beings that hate God and they hate humanity and they want to destroy us. But you just, I just want to, I really want to impress upon you that it's okay to believe that they're real. It's okay to experience these things and acknowledge it and it's okay to talk about it if this is happening to you you need deliverance if this is happening to you people seem to think you know we're so egotistical we think we can control this stuff or that we can manipulate it or use it for our own benefit but you can't they're greater beings than you and the only reason that I currently have any authority over demons or that my husband had authority to cast them out of me is because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will work through us, but the power is the Holy Spirit. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. It is the Holy Spirit that you need. And the only way, the only way that the Holy Spirit can come and dwell with you is if you accept Jesus Christ. If you believe that he was the Messiah and you give your soul to him, it's it's all connected. Through Jesus we receive the Holy Spirit. It was the gift that one of the one of the things that him dying on the cross provided for us, which is amazing because before the time of Jesus, people didn't have this. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. And we live in this time period where you can you can literally have this this blessed assurance and this comforter and this defender of your soul and you need it because we are in a spiritual war. We're in a spiritual battle, and the cost is our souls. And the demons, they just have one, the demons and Satan, they just have one goal. And they're basically just filled with hatred for God and hatred for God's creation, and they want to destroy you. So, you know, that's a warning. It really is. It's a warning from me to you. I've been there. I've seen it. I know what I know what I know. I know this is the truth. And... I want to share it with you. I want you to have this enthusiasm and this joy and this peace, you know, in my heart that I have in my heart. I want you to share in that because it's not just for me. It, it's for all of us. It's our it's it's what we were made for, this relationship with our creator. But um I will wrap it up here and just say I guess I just want to pray. I want to pray for you all that are watching this and I want to pray for your lives and I want to pray against the demonic that could potentially be in your lives because you know talking about demons is scary but the focus should never be on them it should always be on God because he is greater he is the greatest the most powerful and he's just amazing so even though my testimony is about darkness and terror and demonic entities in the light of Christ it it's obliterated like what happened to me so I'm just gonna pray now Holy Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to share my testimony. Thank you for giving me the boldness and the courage to do this. God, thank you for each and every person that is watching this video. Thank you for their lives and their souls, Father. I pray in Jesus' name over every person whose eyes see this video and whose ears hear these words, Father. I pray in Jesus' name for the salvation of their souls. I pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that if there are any demons attached to these people, that they would be they would be cast out. They have no more authority. In the name of Jesus, the souls that are watching this video are claimed for the kingdom of God. There is there is no authority anymore for demonic works, for demonic presence, or for depression or oppression or just negativity of any kind, Father. I pray in Jesus' name that you would 
fall on these people, that your spirit would fall on them and they would feel your presence and they would feel your holy fire and that they would come into a saving relationship with you, Father. Thank you so much for everything you've done for me and for my family and for my life. I thank you for your protection and your, your, your grace and your mercy and your providence and everything that you've ever given me. I just thank you, Father, and I just want to give my life and my testimony back to you. So, in Jesus' name, amen. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time to watch this. I hope that you're blessed. I, was, I found out at a really young age, obviously too young to really comprehend or understand that you know, my parents weren't my parents and that they had adopted me. And so, you know, growing up with that understanding or that sort of burden really set me off on the wrong track. As, as, as I was going into my teenage years and, and you know, growing up, I was... Uh, yeah, very naturally aggressive. I was um, started to use Class A drugs to try and, in theory, I think it was to try and block out, you know, the pain and, you know, of what I was going through in life. And also just to escape and have a good time, really. And I was getting, you know, involved with the, with the police and getting arrested quite quite a lot um, for, for shoplifting. And it, st it started quite petty and then it, it, it went on from shoplifting to burglaries. And then um, when I was 17, um, I, I committed an armed robbery, which en ended with me being sent to jail. Um, and look looking back now, it gave me a lot of time to think and I actually believe that actually it was God intervening and actually saving me from a lot worse, you know, situation. I think clearly, that although I, I had, you know, a lot of time to think and, you know, I think punishment brings correction and, and remorse, uh, but there was still clearly some real deep-rooted um, anger issues and I struggled to let people into my private space, as it were, and this, you know, took me down, you know, back down a, a road of, of destruction and isolation, really. I met my daughter's mother, uh, 97, 98, um, and we, we, we bought a house together um, and moved to Milton Keynes. Um, and in 2000, my daughter Jade was born, but all the wheels fell off and I just wasn't, I couldn't handle this type of responsibility and um, yeah, just, you know, way of, way of life. And it was like, again, just um, all the anger and, and, and rejection and disappointment just seemed to come up right up to the surface and uh, ended up with, uh, you know, losing my house and, and subsequently losing, you know, my, 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 my my, my marriage and, you know, my daughter. I had my own window cleaning round, so I threw myself into my work and just wanted to, you know, try and build a relationship or, 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 or you know, be there for my daughter as much as I could. But underlining issues uh, was still drinking far too much, still abusing drugs, um, and I had a, a raging temper on me. I um, met a, a new partner and started to um, build a relationship but this was very um, a, it was very toxic, very abusive. Um, I had assaulted um, Caroline on two or three occasions and the police were called out um, and this affected my contact with my with Jade and the social services stopped me having you know access to Jade it all it all came to a head um, when I um, we, we myself and, and my partner the children we, we, we spent the, the weekend down the coast 
seaside and then as we were driving back um, this this rage just you know came on me and I, I ended up punching the windscreen smashing the windscreen from inside the car um, and I said oh you know I'm gonna kill you you's all now and literally um, a couple of miles down the road uh, stopped the car you know outside the house and then I remember everyone just running so as if they were running for their lives I found myself um, basically by by myself because um, I uh, trashed everything again. Every, I pushed everyone away from me, and everyone was, you know, too 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 scared and just frightened to sort of be in my company, really. Um, and I w was just real desperate. Now, and I remember um, one particular Saturday. Now, I remember I was up most of the night just thinking and, you know, just desperate, just for, you know, for, you know, just for, just for some peace and, and just, you know, um, just for this whole, I don't know, episode in, in my life to end, really. And anyway, I um, got up on the Sunday morning and I was, you know, said to myself, no, you know, this, and this, this is it, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to church um, and, and, you know, I, I, need, I, need, you know I, need, I need God, I, you know, I, I, I think he's real. Um, so I was willing to do anything I, I could. I, I turned up, as I said, to church and I remember just thinking, I don't really know what I need to do, but I'm just desperate for you know, for God and um, just to break out of these chains um, and just to end all this misery and, you know, um, pain. And so, yeah, um, they had the service and then they, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 the preacher said, does anyone want to give their life, you know, to Jesus? And I just remember um, putting my hand up and then just floods of tears just coming down my face, literally and uncontrollably. Um, my heart was blah, 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 blah. And then I just went running to the front and um, yeah, re received Jesus into my life. And I remember just, yeah, just, wow, just, just emotions, you know, were everywhere. And yeah, just you know. 11 years on now as a Christian walking with God, I'm in an amazing place, I really feel the peace of God, the love of God, um, the joy of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've I've got a heart of an of an evangelist. Um, I love to to share my faith um, and and tell my story. Um, I've got my testimony on on a, on a like a, a, a track, and so I travel the country and I've been doing for sort of the last three or four years now. For me, it's all about grace. You know, none of us. Can, you know, can earn this. It's not through works. Um, it's not about ticking a load of boxes or, you know, necessarily attending every meeting and being holier than thou. Um, it's all of grace and the love of God and how we can change, you know, take someone from the gutter and uh, impact their life and uh, turn it around, you know, for his good and put, put a new you know, a new, a new identity on you and, and fill you with his spirit and, uh, yeah, send you, send you out, you know, like a fisher of men to uh, impact his kingdom, to reach the lost. About three years ago, my mom passed away. She died of a horrible death that left me questioning why? Because I believe in healing. And I go all over the world and I've seen amazing healings and I've seen them here right in America. But she didn't get physically healed with all my prayers and 
the three years she suffered with Lou Gehrig's disease. I don't know if you're aware of that disease, but it's very, it's worse than cancer. It's worse, it's the most horrible, devilish disease on the earth, I think. So she went ahead and passed away with that. And I was very close to my mother, and we have a very close family. My mom was like one of my best friends. And for those of you that aren't close to your mothers, I'm sorry. I really am, because a mother's love is really something very special. And find forgiveness, because that's okay. The Lord is good anyway. He's always good. So my mom passed away in August of, of um, 2011. And I worked it out in my heart. I wasn't mad at God. Of course, I would never get mad at my Lord. I've learned not to do that. It's never a winning proposition when that happens. <laughs> so I just trusted him and believed, and, and I had led my mother to the Lord um, probably 10 years, 15 years ago. Maybe even, I think before I was married, I am led her to the Lord. We'll be married 29 years, 28 years, I lose track. 1986 is when we got married in June. We'll be married that many years. So it was before that, I led her to the Lord. My friend from New Mexico was visiting me in January after my mom had passed away in August. And I was really depressed. I mean, have you ever just gone to bed sick to your stomach and woke up sick to your stomach and not want to get out of bed like ever? I understand that there's, you know, a mental disease of depression that takes over people's lives. You know, lack of whatever hormones they need causes them to be clinically depressed. I get that. And, but this was just so deep that I just couldn't wake up in the morning because my mother died. You know, and I, everybody gets sad when you lose somebody, but what was starting to happen to me was I was getting gripped with a spirit of grief. There's a difference from being sad, because you rightly so, something sad happens, you're sad, and then there's a spirit that grips you where nothing makes you happy, and you want to just die. You know, that's not the normal kind of grief, okay? I was getting that way. I didn't want to get out of bed. I lost my mother, darn it. And I just was suffering with that every day. So my friend from New Mexico came up, and she was staying with me in January, and I was sharing with her this depression I was in. And I was sharing with her, I can't believe my mother died like that. So we were in conversation like that. And she said, Wendy, why don't you just go ask to see her? <laughs> I go, because I don't go ask to see dead people. <laughs> just don't do that. She's like, no, 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 it happens all the time. People see their loved ones after they die. And, and my grandpa has come to me like three or four times after he died. And, and no, it's no big deal. And I'm thinking, mm, I think that's kind of a big deal. I don't, I don't think I want to do that. And she loves Jesus. You know, she's a very wonderful woman of God. And she's like, no, it's all right, just whatever. And I'm like, okay. So she goes to bed. This is one night. She goes to bed. And I'm sitting there in my chair going, that's weird. I'm not going to ask that. Because you know the story of when, uh, who was it, uh, Saul went to call up, was it uh, who from the dead, Samuel from the dead? Remember that? He went to the witch of Endor and was calling up. And that was just a bad thing to do. Okay, so I wasn't going to do anything like that. Okay, so... I go to bed that night, and I wake up the next morning, like 3.45 in the morning, and I get up, and I have this chair I go to. It's my little recliner. So I went to my chair, and I have this really fuzzy blanket. It's really cool. It's like a bear blanket, and I put it over me, and it was dark. I put it over me, and I got in, like, the fetal position, and I was sad. You know, I just woke up sad, and I go, God. I would never pray to see the dead. I would never do that. You know my heart. You know my heart. I love you and you alone. You're the only one I ever want to see. 
but everybody keeps telling me that you can see your loved ones, and I don't know how I feel about that. I don't, Lord, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to pray to the dead, and, and I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, she's not dead, she's alive, and I went, what? Oh, yeah, I know she's alive, but no, she's alive. You're not praying to the dead. She's alive. And I go, really? Okay. Just stay with me on this, okay? Track with me on this. So I said to the Lord, to Jesus, I said, God, you are my everything. You are my king. You are, you are the one. But if you want me, if you let me see that she's okay, that would be amazing. Like, whoa. You know, because I kind of had some hope, right? And I mean, no sooner than I batted my eyes that fast, I was taken up. I was taken up into atmosphere. And I went up, and on my feet, I was in, I had, remember what I was wearing? Even though physically in my chair I had pajamas on, in my experience, in my encounter, I was fully dressed. I had jeans on. I had a t-shirt on. I had tennis shoes on. And I'm literally, it's like you're standing right there. I could pinch myself like I wasn't dreaming. Okay, this is really happening. You remember when Paul said, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body, but I was just taken to the third heaven and, and I saw things that are so, okay, that I don't know if I was in my body or out of my body, but I was taken there. Okay. So I'm standing on atmosphere and everything underneath me was black and it was kind of like, Ooh, this is cool. And I remember standing there and just floating on atmosphere. And then, and then this huge door, probably from that end of the wall to that end of the wall, as high as the eye can see, I'm in front of this door. And I'm thinking, wow. And immediately the door kind of opens about that much, kind of opens enough so I can, they can see me. And there I was, I was approached with this entity. It didn't have wings. It wasn't a person. It wasn't St. Peter at the door. It was nothing like that. It was like an orb. Are you, are you guys familiar with what orbs are? They're like those round things you see in the, in the photographs. And sometimes you'll see one jet by you. They're like the light that jets by. You see them out of the corner of your eye sometimes. Right there, I'm, I'm encounter with an orb and he, I couldn't see a face on him, and it was a man, because it was a man's voice. Couldn't see arms, it was just this, this floaty thing right there. And, and I went, whoa. He, and he says to me, without a mouth, he didn't have a mouth or eyes or anything, but he said, I could hear his voice, and he said, we've been waiting for you. And I went, oh. And he says, he looks at me like, I could see, even though he didn't have eyes, I could see him looking at me. I could see him like looking from the top to the bottom of my person. And he goes, you can't come in here like that. Take your shoes off. So I'm on atmosphere doing this, right? And I like reach over and I'm just floating on the atmosphere and I put my tennis shoes and they're just floating right there. And it was awesome. And he goes, oh yeah, and you can't come in here like that. And I just felt this wave. He just went like this wave and I was covered in white. And I thought, wow, he goes, come on in. And so um, I did and I'm barefooted and I step and immediately I step and it's gold. Streets are very gold up there. And I'm standing on gold and I thought, wow, barefoot on gold. That's a good song right there. I'm thinking I gotta write a song about being barefoot on gold. So I'm just standing there and I'm just looking as far as the eye can see of just white, people in white, just walking around people in white. And, and you know, a lot of people who have an experience of heaven and go there, they can talk about all the colors and all the, the flowers are this big and you know, all these things they talk about. I didn't see that. And the reason I think I didn't see that is because I believe God wanted me just to see my mother. I wasn't there to inhabit all of heaven. Does that make sense? He's able to focus me on what I needed to be focused on. And what I saw was gold streets, white robes, and I looked to the left there, and I saw a big rock. It was probably 100 feet away. And this woman was sitting on the rock, and she looked at me, and she looked just like that. That was my mother when she was 20. And she looked like that. 
She had her black hair and her little bangs and her young face. That is her, my mother right now in heaven, right now. And she was sitting on the rock and she looked over me and our eyes met and I went, oh, and she's like, oh, like this. And I'm like, oh. And so I, I run over in my little white robe, you know. And I was very in, you know, me. I didn't have my new body. I was very much me. Okay, but she did. She was sitting on the rock, and she had, like, her feet in this water. And I went, oh, and I got on the rock, and I touched her. I go, Mom, I gave her a hug. How are you? She's like, mm-hmm, great. Okay, now, 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 now let, let me ask you all this. You know, some of you, not everyone, but some of you have experienced um, maybe how it felt to be a little bit high on some recreational drugs in your life. Come on, don't act like you haven't, okay? Some of you, I'm not saying everyone, but some of you in this room have. You know that, you know, just that dopey, literal dopey, happy look you have? Like nothing can, can rock you off your whatever, right? Nothing can rock you off. That's the look she had. And I'm thinking, that's perfect peace right there. Wow. Okay, so she's like, ah, oh. and I'm like, okay. So we're sitting on this rock together. I'm with my mom, and we're sitting on this rock, and we're just talking, how are you? And I'm like, she had her feet in the water, so she goes, put your feet in the water. So I did. I put my feet in the water, and I'll tell you right now, I don't have a word. I don't have an English word that can explain to you how beautiful the, the water was. There is no word. The only word I can think of in my language is it was perfect. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. It was perfect. Okay, so let that mean whatever that means to you. And I had my feet in the water, and I'm just like, oh, this is beautiful water. And I'm just got both my feet like this, and we're doing this in the water, right? And I go, what is this water? This is awesome. She said, this is the water that flows from the throne. This is the river of life. And I just was just, it, it's an, I'm still in awe just telling you about it because it was so holy. So I'm sitting there and I just have my feet in the water and I'm like, Mom, is Aunt Bonnie here? She's like, she's here. Is Agnes here? She's here. And I started naming off all these names. You know, my, now my grandma hadn't died yet. So my grandma died in July. So my grandma was still on the earth. Okay, so I didn't ask about that. But I'm like, oh, is Joey here? He's here. And I'm like, oh, really? Where are they? And he goes, and I could just see her face change and go, you're here for me. You're here for me. And I thought, yeah, that knocked me back on why I can't just experience all of heaven right now, you know. So I was sitting here and we talked. And I'm just like, oh, I miss you so much. She goes, I miss you, but you don't, have, you know, we're just having conversation. I can't remember every word that was spoken, but we were just loving, lovingly have, having conversation. And then I hear choirs of, hallelujah. It's choirs of angels, just, just massive amounts of voices and singing. And I believe what the Lord did is he opened up my ears because he had things to tell me. In fact, I was just like, wow, what's that? And my mom's like, those are the angels. They're singing all the time. They're all the time they're singing. I'm like, oh, and I'm just experiencing it and just taking it in and, you know, just being with her and, and experiencing. Oh, I said, where's Jesus, mom? Where's Jesus? Because, you know, I'm just like a little kid up there. And I'm like, where's Jesus, mom? She's like, she goes like this. She goes, he's here. He's the son. I'm like, okay, I get that, but no, really, where is Jesus? You know, where I want to see him. No, honey, he's right, he's right here. And, and I know the Bible talks about that, that there will be no need of sunshine. There will be no need of anything because he will be all the all in all, right? And she was experiencing that. And I thought, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put that on the back burner, but I really do want to see him, you know. But that wasn't my moment. My moment was to be with her. Okay, so I hear the angels singing, and then all of a sudden, God begins to speak to me. And he spoke to me through my mind. And I could hear his voice loud and clear. 
And it was the, it was the voice of the Father. It wasn't Jesus. You know, my sheep know my voice. This wasn't Jesus' voice. This is the Father's voice. And he said, he said, Wendy, and he called me by name. Oh, just telling you makes me want to cry. He said, Wendy, and he started telling me the reason for the cross. He started telling me the reason for the cross of Jesus. He said, Wendy, before Jesus went to the earth and died on the cross for the sins of mankind, this place was empty. Jesus populated heaven, Wendy. Jesus populated heaven. I had nobody up here. I was by myself. It's basically what he was saying. And he said, Jesus, and then when Jesus died, he went down into the belly of the earth and he started bringing my remembrance about, you know, the scripture where Jesus went down and set the captives free and went in and all those that were in Abraham's bosom waiting for the promise of Messiah were all set free and got to come up to be with God forever in everlasting life. That was so real to me when he was speaking. And this is just mind to mind. You know, since we have the mind of Christ, that's how he talks to you. Mind of God to mind of man. Mind to mind. Mind to Christ, right? And I could just hear his, his mind mixing with my mind. And he just said, he said, Jesus populated this place. And I went, oh goodness. It was like all of revelation. Just my mind was so expanded. I just wanted to burst. I, because I was still in my body, you know, and I'm experiencing this experience in heaven. Then my mom immediately, she turned, she knew God was talking to me for all I know. She could hear it too. Okay. He was telling us both this, but I know I was hearing it. She turned around and she puts her hand on my knee and she said, Wendy, Thank you for telling me about this place. Thank you for telling me about this place. Because when I became a Christian in 1977, you could not shut me up. You could not shut me up. I had a vision in my bedroom of Jesus Christ, and you could not tell me that didn't happen. And when I went downstairs that next morning and told my mother and my father what happened to me, they thought I was crazy. They told me I was in a cult. They told me that I was mentally ill, that I needed medication, that I was making this stuff up. They told me, my mom, I remember, I'm just I'm reverting for a minute here. My mom was in the kitchen one morning when I was telling her about Jesus Christ and about his death on the cross and about his resurrection and then there's the everlasting life for us when I was telling her that in the kitchen she turned to me she goes you shut up or I'm going to come over there and slap your face she told me that she did I'm going to slap your face if you don't shut up and I looked at her and I go you know what you need to come slap me right now because Jesus said I would be persecuted for him so come on bring your best shot I told my mother that. Come, right now. And she just went, ah! And she would slam the door and go outside. That's how adamant she was against the gospel. And when I visited her in heaven, and she turned to me, and she put her hand on my knee, and she said, Wendy, thank you for telling me about this place. Thank you. Because I didn't give up. And every chance I had, I shared with her at the expense of getting kicked out of my house. So, back up into the kitchen, there was very tense in my home for about two months. But I just took it out to the streets. I just took the gospel to Stockton took it on the streets with the people in my church. And my mom, I'd come home and she'd say, I don't want you going on the streets, they're too dangerous. I go, Mom, Jesus is my refuge. He will protect me. You know, everything was just about Jesus. So finally, she finally gave her heart to the Lord. I remember being in the, the living room probably two or three months later, and I said, Mom, are you sure you don't want to meet this man that I love so much? You know, are you sure? Because he's awesome. And then I remember one time she said, I can never give my heart to Jesus. I could never do that because your dad might divorce me if I did that. 
I mean, things like that. She struggled and struggled to finally, finally break down and say yes to me. So when I was in heaven visiting her, and she did that to me, I just thought, wow, it was worth it. Thank you, Jesus. So after that, when she was just thanking me so much for telling her about God in heaven, I felt myself starting to slip off the rock. It was like gravity, literal gravity was pulling me back down to the earth. I could feel it. And I grabbed the rock and I grabbed her and, I'm, and I cried out to God in my loudest voice possible. I just said, no, no, not yet. No, I don't want to go. I don't. No, God, please, no. And I remember trying to reason with him. I remember him reasoning and I said, God, my husband will understand. He'll come down this morning and I'll be in the chair dead, but he'll know that I'm with you. It's okay. I don't have to go back. And he said, no. He said, when do you have to go back? You have to tell people about this place. Uh, I grew up in Miami. I was raised in a Christian home. I went to school for two years at Christian school and all that. I was raised, my, we were raised Southern Baptist. And then we went to uh, non-denominational but my daddy beat me all my life. I mean, physically, I was the oldest kid. He'd be mad at his work, he'd be mad at my mom, he'd be mad at my brother, everything he took out on me. He'd come home from work and if he was mad, he'd go in my drawers if my, just to look for something, if my socks wouldn't roll right or something. And he physically just beat me. And that always put a lot of hatred, meanness in me. So I left home at a very young age. I lived on the streets of Miami, living however I could live till I got old enough I had actually gotten some trouble from doing drugs. And I went before uh, a court judge and, and he was going to put me in prison and my dad asked uh, if they would let me have a choice of either doing prison time or going to the military. In order to go to the military they would have to drop all charges. So that's what we did. So when I was 17, I went into the military. My permanent duty station was in El Paso, Texas. Well, in El Paso, Texas, I got mixed up with this uh, motorcycle club out there. And I was running dope from Mexico into El Paso. And it, what always brought me into that was because it was kind of like the family that I that I was looking for. And a lot of the people that end up in these clubs and stuff are people that don't really have a good family home or nothing. They just want to feel loved and that's what they get in these groups, you know? And there's a unity there. I mean, these people die for each other. I ended up getting busted. And uh, at the time, the, the club got me out. Um, paid my bond and then my parents bought me a bus ticket. That's how I ended up with, here with Georgia with nothing but the clothes on my back. I left everything behind. Uh, of course, still riding motorcycles, riding Harleys and got mixed up with the wrong bunch again. And next thing you know, I was doing drugs again. Well, it started off, you know, once a month and it started off twice a month. And it started off with just a weekend thing. Next thing you know, it turned into a few more days a week. Before you know it, it turned into a daily thing. Well, I got to where I had a daily habit of the methamphetamine. And at the time, I was getting the stuff for free, so I felt like it wasn't taking nothing from me and my family. Needless did I realize, is all the things that were falling amongst me that I had no clue of. It. It's like I had blinders on. I was a sorry dad. I mean, I'll be the first to admit. Um, I give her everything she needed, but I wasn't there when she needed me. You know, I just, uh, I was a sorry dad. I wish I would have known how to be a real dad. I didn't have um, a real dad to learn from. 
uh, I always knew that I didn't want my kid to hate me as much as I hated my dad because the way he physically abused me. So I never laid my hands on her, you know. I did the opposite things that that I felt like I wouldn't get in to her. But, you know, when you have a drug addiction, unfortunately, it, it comes before everything. And uh, I can't, I can't take back, you know, I can't get those years back. If I knew the changes that it made in me, as far as my brain was, the way I think, uh, everything, uh, I would have never done it. Because there's, there's things in me that'll never reverse again, and it'll never be the same. God started convicting me of it. I started getting miserable. Didn't matter how much money I made, and how much drugs I did, I was just miserable. One day, I just said, enough is enough. And it was obvious I couldn't run my life the way it needed to be run. So I learned that if I can't do it, who else do I have to turn to to run my life but Christ? I actually isolated myself to my room for a year. I had to get away from all my friends that I've rode Harleys with for 20 years and hung around for all these years. And the fact of being on methamphetamine, it intensifies everything. You, you get to sweats, um, you isolate yourself. You're just miserable, you don't want to talk to nobody, you want to hide, you just want to get in a corner and hide. You know, you don't care if you die, you don't care, you know, it's like your world's come to an end. My only hope, my only hope was God, period. And I prayed to God, I said, God, if you'll get me through this, I will live the rest of my life for you. But Satan the whole time was still tugging at me, tugging at me. It felt like the closer I got to God, the more Satan was fighting me. And the only way that I found it worked for me to keep me going, am I gonna let Satan win this morning or am I gonna let Christ win this morning? Well, I decided I'm gonna let Christ win this morning. Miracles didn't start happening in my life until I learned to put God first. I learned to let go and let God. The closer I get to him, the more you look out for things that you never noticed before that God does in your life and the people around you. I was always stressing, 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 stressed, stressed all the time. And a lot of uh, the drugs used to relieve that. Now. I don't do drugs, and what relieves that is the peace of mind that I get from Christ, from the miracles that He showed me. The weight has been lifted, the straight so far. Your mercy draws me near, it's in Jesus I have found. My debt has been paid, though I've gone so far. Your grace finds me here. Well, then I started, I started getting tattoos of God, not only for me to have to look at constantly to keep God at the head of my forefront, but also I've had more opportunities to witness. And it shows people I'm not ashamed to be a Christian. No matter where I go, I have it all over me. My joy comes from giving rather than receiving. It's uh, it's funny how it's the opposite of how I thought joy would be, and it is totally opposite. I guess that's why I was always miserable, because I never had joy. And I'm still a work in progress. I'm far from the man I'm going to be, but I'm a better man than I've ever been.
And it's all, it, I give God all the glory and all the honor because it, it wasn't me. I, my whole thing is I gave it to God. I said, God, here I am. Do with me what you will. I remember my mom, she had a um, gentleman that she was uh, helping and then he came about and he gave me a palm reading um, and he was telling me about my future and I thought that was exciting and he, he told me about my future that I'll get into uh, yoga, uh, meditation and something triggered something in, in me. And um, one day when I, was, I wanted to break from my studies, I, I wanted to um, memorize more of my, uh, my, the things I wanted to study for. So I've heard that it helps when you meditate. When you meditate, it helps with memory consolidations. So I'm like, oh, I'll give it a try. So I had a soundtrack and they were called um, chakras or like binaural neural beats. And so I sat there and I remember, I still remember very clearly um, the entire, like when I sat down on my bed, I just sat there. And it wasn't like calming, like it, it was something in me. So I, I was just like, oh wow, this is exciting. I could felt like stuff moving in my body. I didn't know at first it was spirits, but I thought this was very exciting. So I'm like, oh wow, there must be something more than the external. So that's when I started to um, really get interested in internal. Um, and that's how I got into the new age. That's how it, it just lifted. And um, so I, I just thought about that, that um, my mom's friend, where he said, you're going to start doing yoga. So in a way it triggered this, this um, journey of mine. And as I was on Instagram, uh, as I was on Instagram, I saw a Instagram post about Krishna Yoga Village. And I thought it was a sign from the universe because they always talk about, you know, uh, consciousness and, you know, you're part of the universe, you're center of the universe. And you hear these um, constantly, uh, you know, even every day to life, like you'll be walking and people will be talking about it. And sometimes it could just be embedded in you. Um, and so I thought about it, I'm like, this must be a sign. Like maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. So I went there with my friend and it was very exciting. It was, it was a, I would say it's a false religion <laughs> and they will chant and chant and chant and they'll teach you and it's, it's nice because you have farm work and you volunteer and everything like that but then that's how it grew I got very into it I got very into the meditation the yoga and then the false religion on top of it and then when the false religion is it was like a village so it was a village filled with um, a cult and the village offered Reiki um, so I was like, oh, what is Reiki? Like, I heard about this, I read about it, and I was very interested in it. And, and so I did Reiki. I, went, I was just like, okay, so then I got, uh, the woman did Reiki on me, and I was like, wow, I feel so much peace. But, um, and then she was talking, and she did reading on me. Um, she did reading on me and saying about my future, and then I saw like something in her that gravitated me towards um, the things that she did. So she, in a way, inspired me, inspired me to do those things, which is very, um, not very good, that journey. Um, so I started doing Reiki and then I started doing um, channeling. Uh, and then I started talking to spirits and then I started doing automatic writing. Uh, so you talk to like, basically automatic writing is the spirits take over you and you just write and whatever they say. And, um, and then I did, uh, and then I got to, went to a festival and then I did sh shamanism and then I got into Buddhism and then I did uh, the 10 day intense Vipassana meditation. Whew, that's a lot. I did heaps, everything you can think of, you know, um, and I did a lot of like psychedelic um, and I took um, like, I let them, oh, I let them take, like I let these spirits take over me and um, and uh, what they do is I let them take over me and like they could be dancing or whatever. And I thought that was okay. I didn't know why. And because I was just so intrigued of seeking the truth, but I never found the truth. I kept seeking and seeking and seeking and everyone was talking about love, but the more you get into it, the more selfish you got. Um, the more 
less compassionate I got, the more egotistical I got. And uh, I became a vegan, you know, caring about the life of this life, this corrupted society, um, thinking I was a light worker, but I was not. And then um, I started to see myself, like my body, like I didn't feel myself anymore. I, I started to feel really internally dirty, like very unclean. And I would put a facade uh, and everyone thinks I'm happy. I mean, all joyful, but inside I felt I was losing more and more myself and some, something was taking over me. And I thought it was okay because I'm like, maybe this was meant to be, you know, maybe I'll find the truth later. Basically, I, I saw another Instagram post and her name was Simona Rich. Uh, so her name is Simona Rich and she told me the truth about it. And she's, cause she, I followed her when she was in the um, occult. But then she said, this thing is a whole lie. Uh, Jesus is just your savior, savior. And I got freaked out and ran to my sister, crying to her. And I'm just like, oh my goodness, damn. This, this is what I feel. I feel like something's taking me over. And, um, and I started crying and it was a very like traumatic experience for me, realizing that something, that I'm not me anymore. And I was so desperate. And that's how I came to Jesus because I was seeking the truth. And I did find it, but I had to go through the entire lie and deception that Satan has put me in. He even, you know, told me to leave my friends. He even told me what to do, where to go. I was like a follower of him. He told me to, he gave me these opportunities. I got into um, a relationship with a woman and, um, you know, and my sister started doing channeling and saying that we were meant to meet, we're meant to be together. And, you know, she's one of my soulmates and all these lies and, um, and they would be telling me like, you have to let go of this friend. You have to go here. Um, you have to do this. And, and that's how it got me to Cairns and how I left my studies for a semester. And I was just fully into destruction of myself um, because I was seek I wanted to surrender my, myself to something. But I didn't realize there was, you know, Jesus and Satan, you know, I thought it was just the universe. Um, and I didn't know there was a kingdom of God and kingdom of Satan. And as soon as I, uh, I got baptized, um, you don't have to be, go to a church to get baptized. I got baptized in my friend's bathtub online with uh, like, uh, I don't know, um, about 10 people watching me and praying for me online. Uh, because it's ultimately the power of God. It's not, it's not the church itself, because we are the church. And um, so that after that, I felt like a new person. I still remember that moment, you know, where I was came to Christ and um, I felt like I literally died with Christ and I rose, um, rose with Christ. And, but after that, uh, it, it, was, it was intense. Uh, I will get torment, tormented every single day. Um, I will get boils like really, really hot and sweaty. And they will give me voices, um, you know, like rape, murder, you know, have your soul. And they will say like, um, I'll get a lot of fear and anxiety. Everything you think of, like, um, you know, pedophilic thoughts and um, everything was in my head. I didn't feel like I felt movement in my body. I didn't feel this body anymore. Um, and I will sleep, but I will wake up at two and two or three in the morning. Um, almost every single day and receive boils in my body and um, you know hearing the sound and and say Satan 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 you know you're, you're ugly you're dirty and anything that they can do to defile me and make me scared and not believe and have faith in Christ uh, and um, I'll just receive a lot of attacks that the boils were the most um, prevalent ones um, and voices in my head like schizophrenia, mood disorders, I'll cry for no reason. Um, and um, I, have, I will have a lot of like demonic dreams and like I remember I was in a corner 
and the demon came to me and I was really small I was like this small the demon was huge and it came to me and it was trying to have sex with me um, I don't know if this is too yeah but it was just like it was trying to have sex with me and I was just like this and um, yeah and I'll constantly feel that I mean hear that every day you know I want to have sex with you Tram I want to do this to you Tram um, I want to murder you you know kill yourself so many voices in my head um, and that's when I started to really start to believe in Christ more you know when you go to the darkest place you need Christ to save you. everyone who's seeking the truth you know Jesus is the truth the life in the only way and the light you know he <laughs> yeah. said seek and you shall find and he's really true to his word and whoever is seeking the truth don't get into the new age it's, it's um, very demonic and uh, it shows you this even though you think you're enjoying this ecstasy and this joy it's not something that's you still true feel like there's more and more and more and you your cravings will go further and further towards it and you get into this hole that you never you get more blinded and more blinded and more blinded because the spirits become more powerful than I you. recommend whoever is in the cult right now to really read the Bible and see for yourself and ask just you could just sit down and ask Jesus you know if you're real come into my heart and he will definitely come into your heart I felt it when I said those words I felt his heart like him come into my heart I recommend not to follow <laughs> that cult or any of the new age even though it sounds exciting uh, you you can start to lose yourself more and more even though you're trying to seek yourself you lose yourself um, and to be saved and to be fulfilled because we always had that void everyone's always seeking something because they have that void inside of them and it's like this spiritual void or something but I guarantee you, when you go to Jesus, He fulfills you, He fills you up and you will feel full. That's what I felt, um, spiritually and physically full. Um, sometimes you don't even need to think to eat because <laughs> you're so full. Uh, so yeah, that's what I recommend is to see it for yourself. Um, ask Jesus to your heart and you will see it, you see the truth. I hear the Holy Spirit say, lay down on the bed. Well, we got furniture showroom. You know, it's a furniture store. We got a bed. And uh, so I'm like, uh, okay. So I test the spirits and it's him. And I'm like, uh, why do you want me to lay down? And he says, you either lay down or I'm going to knock you down. Oh, okay. So I lay down and it's him and I'm praying. I got my eyes closed and... I hear all these little voices, some close up, some far away, saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And they're, they're hushed, they're excited, they're not fearful, but they're, they're buzzing. And I'm like, uh, who's coming? He's coming, he's coming. Now, I understand how Paul says, in the spirit or in the flesh, I don't know. Because all of a sudden, I'm not on the bed. I'm somewhere solid, absolutely real, not heaven, on my knees, face down, hands out in front of me, kneeling, balled up, as small as I can ball up. And everything is black. And I got my eyes pinched shut. Way, way off in the distance. There's a little perfect, pure white light that's getting closer. And it's Jesus. And however much I thought it was a good idea before... Now I'm really regretting that I asked for it. And I'm, I'm, I'm completely aware of my blackness 
and his whiteness, of, of his holiness. Now, I, I, I'm doing pretty well with the Lord at that point. I'm repented up. I, I'm, I'm not in any willful sin. Porn is way long time before. You know, I'm not perfect, but I'm on short accounts with him, and I think I'm pretty clean. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, I am acutely aware. There, there's no, there's no sense of, of, of judgment, like he's going to condemn me or he's going to, he's going to accuse me of stuff I didn't do or, or I'm going to go to hell if he gets closer or he's not going to like me. There's nothing like that. My only thought is, I'm deathly afraid that some part of my blackness might stick to his whiteness and defile him. That's it. There's nothing else. There's there's no there's no awareness of what's right or fair or just or anything. I am completely aware at that moment that I deserve the worst. And that he is perfect. And I don't want any of me I don't want him to get any closer for fear that I might taint his holiness. And that light keeps getting closer and closer. And I'm seeing it out the top of my head. It's so bright. And I got my head down and my hands down on the ground. And I'm balled up as tight as I can. And I'm like, please go away. Please, I'm so sorry. It was a bad idea. I should have never asked. Please just go away. Just go away. Don't get any closer. And that light keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And I don't know how long it took. I don't like telling this story because it's so holy and people mock it or twist it or something and I just fear for them better not better not to have the ammunition but the Lord says okay so He gets closer and closer and closer and closer, and I can feel him standing. I can see his feet through my head, right just inches standing ahead of me. And he's standing up, and I'm balled up and down on the ground. And I'm begging for him to go away. And he says, put your hands on my feet. Oh! No, no, sir. No, I'm not touching you. I'm scared to death of getting anything of me on you. I don't want to do any such a thing. I don't. Please don't make me. Please don't make me. And he says, do it. In a real firm, like, I'm not mad at you, but you're going to do what I tell you to do. I slide my hands up and I can feel his feet. And my eyes are shut as hard as I can shut them and I can see his feet. I can feel the hairs on his feet. And all I can tell you is that he's more real than you are. This whole thing we think is reality is a purple crayon on the back of a bar napkin. This is some crusty old black and white cinema scope celluloid thing from I don't know 1930s. This is this is nothing compared to what's really real. The colors and the smells and the flavors and the and all of it. I've never done a drug in my life. I've never pick one. Mushrooms, marijuana, anything. Nothing, nothing ever. I've never been drunk. I've never been on any depressants or any psychotics or anything except the hay fever medicine. 
This was not a product of my imagination. This was not a dream. It was not a vision. I was wide awake. And it was more real than this is. And I have my feet, my hands on his feet, and I'm crying. He says, put your thumbs in the hole. And there's a hole in his ankle, and I don't want to. I don't want to. Oh, Lord, I don't want to. He says, do it. And I roll my hand up, and I'm crying, and I'm crying, and I feel the hole in his ankle. And he says, stand up. I don't want to. Lord, I don't want to. And he's being real patient. And he bends over, grabs me by the armpit, and stands me up. And I still got my head trying to suck my head into my body like a turtle. Eyes closed as tight as I possibly can, and I'm still seeing him out the top of my head. He's so bright. We're in a white robe. And he takes my, my hand and he sticks it in a fold in the robe and puts it on the scar in his side. And I feel the skin and the hair and the scar the hole and crying and crying and crying. I had prayed for for a lot, a lot at that point. Fasted without food and water a lot. Probably 200 days out of that year before that. To see through the eyes of Jesus. To have wisdom. To help bear his burden. To be used however he wanted. To give up whatever he asked of me. For wisdom. And I'm standing there crying. He holds his hands out, says, hold my hands, and I don't want to. He grabs my hands, puts my hands in his, and says, feel the hole, and I slide my hand up his arm and feel the hole in his wrist. Put my thumb in the hole, and I'm crying and crying and crying. And all the while, just, just asking him to go and, and saying I'm sorry for ever asking <laughs> and uh, he takes my hand and puts it on the side of his face and I can feel beard hairs and skin and everything more real than you are And he's standing, you know, that far away to where it's, I'm not reaching way out. I'm just, I'm, I've got my hand against his face. And he says, don't be afraid. In a way that lets you know that he's about to do something that will terrify you. <laughs> and, and you will instantly be afraid and you have every right to be afraid. And he's telling you not to. Because whatever he's about to do is going to make you afraid. <laughs> so it just makes me more afraid. But I want to be obedient. So I'm trying to just stand there and wait and see what he's going to do. And he takes a step toward me. Okay, now... You know, he's in my buffer zone. Now you're getting a little close. He says, don't be afraid. Which, of course, makes me more afraid. <laughs> or at least I think, you know, I should be way, way more afraid. And he takes another step toward me like he's going to headbutt me or kiss me straight on. And says, don't be afraid. 
and I feel, I hear my heart racing, pounding, 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 pounding. And he leads in, and right when I feel like he's going to headbutt me, his head goes into my head, and I hear his heartbeat. No problem. Boom, boom. At mine. And he takes another step and steps in, and I'm standing there. I hear the heartbeats. I hear my heartbeat slow down to his, and I know everything, and I am in the mind of Christ, and I see the whole panorama of creation as if it's all done, and there's a new heaven and a new earth, the judgments are over. And it's perfect. I can't tell you who got into heaven and who didn't. I can't tell you what the new Jerusalem looks like. I can't tell you anything except all that I could contain at that moment was an awareness that it was all perfect. That all of creation for eternity would sit with its mouth open, marveling at how God tied it all up with a bow and everything was just. There was nothing left out. There was an explanation for everything and it made perfect sense. And it had to be that way. And it was fair and it was right and it was just and it was good. Every kid in Africa that died of AIDS, every... every person that was raped or molested or hurt or whatever somehow beyond my capacity to understand it was all part of the plan and it was all necessary and it was all tied up with a bow and justice was served on, on those who did wrong and, and mercy on those who needed mercy and it was perfect perfect no, no string un, untied, no nothing left undone, perfect. And I couldn't process anything but that, and I stood there, and I marveled, and I cried. I said, oh, God, I had no idea. Everything is part of the plan. It's perfect. And I don't know. If it was five minutes or ten minutes or half an hour. But I knew everything. Couldn't, couldn't retain it, couldn't process it, couldn't whatever. But I saw the end and it was perfect. Perfectly just. Perfectly righteous. Nobody could argue. Nobody could say I was done wrong and justice wasn't meted out or I shouldn't be here in the lake of fire or anything. Even people that were in heaven and didn't think they deserved it, the Lord would show them. They could, everybody could see the whole thing and everybody knew. All of creation knew and marveled at how good the Father is, how perfect his plans, how much he knew the end from the beginning, how every butterfly, every speck of dust, every little dog, every everything was part of the plan. And then I'm laying on the bed of the furniture store with, <laughs> you know, it's the Holy Spirit when you don't even care how long the snot string is all the way to the ground. 
and I just lay there for I don't know how long another hour just trying to recover from it all and and limp home and uh, knowing that I'll never be the same after that some people don't understand how I've endured everything I have because it's all part of the plan how have you put up with some of the people you have to put up with because it's part of the plan How do you have the faith, month after month after month, to not know how the bills are going to get paid? Because God's on the throne, and it's all part of the plan. I don't know. I don't think I'm special. Like... God did that for me and he doesn't do it for anybody else I know lots of people we got several here that Jesus showed up and gave him a hug or something he's real when somebody some atheist argues with me their opinion that God's not real I don't argue my opinion that God is real I met Jesus in person and he's more real than you are he is exactly who he said he was and is and will be and I don't serve him for the hopes of going to heaven I serve him because he's a righteous God that deserves to be served no matter what happens to me I don't preach a lot about heaven and hell because I think it's humanism, I think it's hedonism to serve him for a reward or to serve him to avoid punishment. I serve him because he's worthy to be served no matter what happens to me. I pray in the name of Jesus. That everybody that sees this video, that somehow, some way, he would show up in your life and show you how real he is. That he would give you an understanding, an eyewitness testimony of how loving and true and righteous and holy he is. How much he loves you, how much he died for you, took your sins to hell punched your bus ticket <sighs> thanks for listening it's just one of a lot of stories a lot of stories I don't tell Heaven's real. And Jesus is real. And God is real. And time is running out. And you need to get real. Say you're sorry for your selfishness and hypocrisy and fleshiness and chasing the things of this world instead of obeying God. You need help finding Jesus. Go to our website, email, give us a call. Phone numbers are there. Fellowshipofthemartyrs.com. <sighs>